that matter mechanisms. Uh, we're trying to move electrons, so find your source of electrons and move them. Okay, move them from wherever your source is to some other place. Okay, in the case of resonance, uh, hopefully you're at the point now where you don't have to draw terrible resonance structures and realize they're terrible after you've drawn them. Um, but that may still be the case, that's fine. So if we had something along these lines, that is showing up, right? Yeah, in our upper left-hand corner there. We could try and draw resonance by moving the electrons down towards our center carbon, because we can move from atom to bond, okay, and see if we haven't invalidated our octets, okay? If we take a look at that central carbon, how many bonds would it now have? We'd have five bonds which means we've exceeded the octet. We have to fix that by breaking, uh, in the case of resonance, breaking a pi bond. Okay, well, the only pi bond we've got is the one we just made, so the electrons go right back, which means how many resonance structures do we have? None. Okay? So the idea is to move those electrons and shuttle them around. Ultimately, we're moving lone pairs and pi bonds. That's all you can really touch with resonance. If you break a sigma bond, it's not valid, you're no longer doing resonance, and you've moved into the realm of doing a mechanism, okay, or an actual reaction, okay? Um, when it comes to mechanisms, it's the same general idea. Move the electrons to where you think they should be going. Um, remember the distances in which you can move them, atom to bond, uh, or bond to atom. If you really want to get creative, you can jump bond to bond. That's something that's typically done in resonance, not so much in mechanisms. Okay? So we're moving very, very short distances when we're dealing with mechanisms um, just to the new bond forming, ultimately. Okay? If after that shift of electrons, you've exceeded the octet, that's fine. Just like with resonance, you now have to evaluate. Do you have a weak bond that you can break? We'll aim for pi bonds first. If there's no pi bond, then we can start to break weak polar sigma bonds. Why are polar bonds weak? It's the unequal sharing of electrons. Okay? So if you can see that there is some situation where you've got those weak bonds, then you can take the electrons out of that bond and move them to the atom, the more electronegative atom, and take the electrons away. Okay? So you have to be very careful when you push the uh, draw out mechanisms. Um, make sure you're showing your arrows appropriately because that will result in massive amounts of points being deducted. Okay? If you start showing me atoms moving, you will lose points. Okay? Um, asking for a mechanism. So... As you've seen in the quizzes, I've asked about mechanisms in a variety of different ways. Uh, I'm going to steal your quiz. So on quiz 13, question 3, I think it's question 3, it asks for which type of reaction and mechanism. Um, I'm not asking for drawing curved arrows there. In that case, I'm trying to distinguish between substitution, be it SN1 or SN2. So if I'm asking you to name a mechanism, that goes back to the basic reaction types. So we've got substitution, elimination, acid base, addition. The substitution and the elimination both break down further into SN1 or one type and two type. Okay? So if I ask you to name a mechanism, that's what I'm asking you to do. Specify which one of those it sets up as. If I ask you to provide a mechanism, okay, I will try and make sure it also says in the question, use curved arrows or use curved arrow formalism. That's coming back to what this slide is, is telling you to do or teaching you, trying to give you the rules for how to do. You have to show how the electrons move using your curved arrows, okay? Step by step by step, okay? Um, I don't think we have any direct questions on that that you could ask now, right? If you've got questions, please just stop me. Otherwise, I'll try and go reasonably fast through it. Chapter 4, we've got alkene structure and nomenclature. Um, there's not a whole lot within Chapter 4. We've got the nomenclature rules. So you're looking at alkenes, the ending being E-N-E. -E, uh, and you just kind of follow through the rules as standard. 
You're allowed to use the IUPAC names um, and common names. I'll accept both, though I will be grading specifically for the IUPAC. Those are the ones I'll look for first. If you're going to use common names, uh, my nomenclature is hopefully good enough that I'll be able to recognize what you're talking about and grade you appropriately. Okay? Um, those will let me just require practice in memorizing your rules. So, what uh, else I can tell you there? The other addition that we can get with our alkenes is doing cis-trans nomenclature. So knowing when to use cis-trans or EZ um, as far as naming goes, and then also how to identify when it happens. So we've got the rules on how to identify, cut your bonds perpendicular. Okay, so we can cut in half perpendicular to the pi bond. Determine, that's a bad example because that one doesn't have one. We'll cut perpendicular, that's an eraser. Cut perpendicular and try and find uh, priorities on the sides. So we're looking at carbon versus hydrogen. Carbon's higher priority, we can star it. Carbon versus hydrogen, star it. Cut now parallel and decide where your stars are. Are they on the same side or opposite sides of that line? Same side, we're looking at uh, cis. Uh, opposite sides, we're looking at trans. Okay. If you have uh, less than two hydrogens, so one hydrogen or zero hydrogens, you must use the EZ nomenclature instead of cis and trans. Okay. Other than that, hopefully you guys are okay with that material. Yes? Do we have to structure an extra structure? Oh, good question. Um, I did mention mean to mention that. When we go down into this last case here, what you're talking about for the cyclic structure, we could go through and determine cis and trans on this. Okay? And we could go through and we'd say that we have indeed a cis double bond. Okay? Because we got our stars here, here, same side of that line. Okay? However, does this exhibit cis trans isomerism? No, because the ring prevents the rotation. Okay, there's no possible physical way that we could somehow get the ring and the double bond uh, and have a trans alignment. Okay, so if I asked, does it have cis-trans isomerism with a ring? The answer is no. Okay, because there's no need, and then there's no need to go on and answer anything else. Okay, so if you look at, I'm pretty sure it's one of the quizzes, quiz 11, as I read over your shoulder, um, question three looks at a cyclohexane. Okay, let's just go up with a whiteboard. We've got a cyclohexane structure. Oof. Whatever, close enough. And we could go through and answer the questions. The first question asks is, does it exhibit cis-trans isomerism? We've got a double bond, so we might immediately say, oh, let's start counting out if it has cis and trans. But if we remember the rule, okay, our ring structures, at least as far as the ring structures you'll see in this class, do not exhibit cis-trans isomerism because we cannot physically change that double bond and have the ring in the same structure, which means the answer is no. No cis-trans isomerism. What's the next question? If it's yes, then tell me if it's cis or trans. Okay, so what's the answer, or the only answer you would need for this question? No. Okay, you can still go through and answer if it's cis or trans, that's fine, but you're doing extra work that's not necessary to what the question asked. Okay, does that make sense? Which is presumably where you were asking that from. Okay. Other questions on the cis and trans? Um, degrees of unsaturation was looking at formulas. I had actually forgotten about it until I started to go through and summarize things. So you cannot, exp or if I forgot about it, I wouldn't expect a whole lot of questions on it as far as your exam goes. Probably at most five points, but you're probably looking less than that as far as determining it. What we're doing is comparing formulas of a saturated alkane to some unknown. If it is unsaturated, I or in other words, it has double bonds, uh, or pi bonds, or rings, then we have to lose two hydrogens. It's ultimately all these formulas are telling us, is that the hydrogen count changes from a saturated structure. OK? 
Okay. So you should be able to look at it and tell me the degrees of unsaturation. Okay. I don't really want to work through an example on this one unless you guys really want me to. Yes, no. Oh. I heard three no's, one yes. I think we'll go with majority rules and say for the yes, go back to the slides or that lecture. So it was the first alkene lecture um, and it went through those examples. Okay, so you should see plenty of examples for that. We just won't do more now. Okay. I don't think I even asked any unsaturation questions on the quizzes. Okay. So it's a really, really small topic. Wouldn't expect a whole lot. Okay. Isoprenes was the tail end of chapter four. Um, isoprenes are ultimately what make up the group of compounds known as terpenes. So isoprenes are an incredibly relevant biological molecule. It's where all or most biological compounds are based from. It's how they end up reacting and building larger superstructures. So you're going to be responsible for being able to identify uh, isoprene units within an individual molecule, um, both counting and showing me where they are. Okay? So we'll pick the easy one there. We can think, take a look at, I think that's limonene. We've got an isoprene unit here, and we have one here. Those two isoprenes are connected through our green bonds. Okay? So the questions that you could expect to see, how many isoprenes make up the structure of limonene, um, and identify those isoprene units. So you'd have to go through and circle within the structure. Okay. Um, since you guys will have to circle, let me make sure that you guys are okay with this, um, as opposed to coloring it in. You would need to make sure that you circle all of the carbons that are in it, so your lines should go through bonds or outside the structure. You'll notice that the points are in each of those. Does that kind of make sense? You see what I'm talking about? Okay. So make sure that you include the carbons within those. If you start drawing the lines through carbon atoms, I don't know if you're trying to include that carbon or not. Okay. Um, worse, when you go through and try and identify a different isoprene, you might end up double counting that carbon okay, or getting yourself confused. So circle through the bonds when you go through and identify those, and that should help out. Questions on the isoprenes? Okay, chapter five um, was a pretty big one as far as our alkene reactivity goes. Um, hopefully you're caught up with most of that homework. And we knew it had to happen. The computer and the iPad had to stop talking. When we're looking at our reactivity for our alkenes, we're ultimately we can compare them back to our alkanes. Um, our alkenes become reactive where our alkanes were not because we now have the pi bond. Okay? So it's that pi bond which has what inside it? What's in that pi bond? Electrons. electrons. How many electrons? Two, Two electrons. So if I'm going to show this reacting, we will show the pi bond act as a source of electrons. You'll always see the arrow start from the pi bond and go out. Okay? and react with something positive. Since it's a source of electrons, we can see it acting as a Bronsted base, Lewis base, uh, or nucleophile, depending on our specific definitions, okay, or what we're looking at within that individual reaction. Okay. Some of the chemistry that we can see. Um, I didn't have time to tweak this slide too much, but instead of saying HCl, I wanted to do H. Nucleophile. So let's make that quick tweak here. When we go through and do a, uh, our alkene reactions, that very first step is our alkene, our pi bond, reacting with some positive atom. The most common reaction to run with our alkenes, as far as we've seen, is it reacting with an acid. Okay, so we'd have H plus. We now have to decide where we put that hydrogen, where that new bond forms, because it can happen at either of those two carbon positions. Okay? 
and this is where we get the Markovnikov rules, the rich get richer. Our hydrogen is going to be added to our structure at the carbon that has the most hydrogens. Okay, so that's the overall rule. Why do we do that rule? Because the result is ultimately where our carbocation ends up. Okay, because we're taking the electrons out to react with a positive charge, which means the other carbon remains positive. I want to generate the carbocation that is the most stable. Okay, once I've got that most stable carbocation, I can then propagate forwards, and I can react beyond that. Okay, so we can now have the nucleophile come in and attack that position. Okay. And that's how we get our product. Okay? We can use fancy words for this, which you'll see in the textbook. This is known as regioselectivity. The nucleophile is only adding to that tertiary carbon. Okay? It's not going to our secondary carbon. So if we color these, the regioselectivity in this reaction is that our nucleophile attaches at the red carbon, not at the green. Okay? So it's region specific. The chemistry is only occurring in very particular regions. Okay? Questions about your standard alkene addition with acids and bases? Or just, sorry, with acids. Would we expect an alkene to react with a base? What does a base look like? Give me your favorite base. Okay, OH and officially OH minus. Okay, if we take a look at OH minus and we compare it to our alkene, our alkene was a source of electrons. What happens when I get electrons near electrons? Tend to repel. Okay, so adding an alkene to a base in most cases isn't going to do anything. Okay, we'd have to add something really, really uh, basic to try and force those to react. Okay, the last thing on here is stereochemistry issues. With this reaction, what's the effect on stereochemistry? So let's take a look at our final product. Okay, do I have a stereo center there? Oops. Let's add another carbon. Do I have a stereo center now in my final product? Yes. Yes. Which means you need to be concerned about wedges and dashes. Okay, that's your upper tier as far as difficulty. So what should we specify as far as this product? Should the nucleophile be wedged or should it be dashed? Or it should be both. In the process of this reaction, we form the carbocation. The carbocation has no stereochemistry. The nucleophile has no stereochemistry, which means our product is going to have a net no stereochemistry as well. Okay, so we lose optical activity, or we wouldn't have any optical activity. So how would we specify that as far as a product goes? Okay, we could call it racemic. What else could we add? We could also do the plus minus next to it. And if we wanted to get really tedious, we could draw out both products. Okay? Questions about our alkenes? As far as naming a reaction, um, I won't use regioselective, uh, except in the quiz is the only place that I think I've even mentioned it. It shows up in your textbook. I think it's unnecessary um, technical terms as far as the reaction goes. The reason Markovnikov is in quotes is I personally have a crappy memory, and I can't remember any of those reactions. Okay. So there's a lot of named reactions, and I sound like an idiot when talking to an expert in the field. So they go, oh, well, what about this and such and such reaction? No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Tell me the reagent, and I'll probably run circles around you as far as drawing out a mechanism, but I have no idea what you're mentioning until I see the reagents. Okay. So I will not ever test on knowing a name of a reaction. You might see Markovnikov show up, but what I'll give you is the reagents. I'll give you the chemicals you can use the chemicals to push forward. Does that make sense? Okay.
Other addition reactions we can do, we can add bromine and chlorine across a double bond. So one of the things, I guess I should have mentioned when we first looked at our alkenes, alkenes are more interesting uh, than say the alkyl halides um, or even really the alcohols because when we look at their reactivity, there's two carbons that are potentially reactive. Right? Whereas an alcohol or an alkyl halide only has one carbon that's reactive. Okay, with an alkene, both of those positions can potentially react, which means if I want to add two groups, an alkene is usually a good starting material because I have reactivity at both of those positions. Okay? So when we're going to do an addition with bromine, I can now add two bromines to the structure as opposed to adding just one if I did, say, an HBr addition. Okay? When we add Br2 or Cl2, we go through this goofy intermediate. That's where we get our bromonium cation. That's that odd-looking triangular structure. Um, the nucleophile, which in this case is bromide, can then do a backside attack to break open the ring, and we end up getting uh, an anti-addition uh, or a trans product. Okay, the bromines are added trans across the ring. Okay, yes? So on the, the spider web thing, it says two products possible. Is that just because you can switch the legend back? Yes. So I think on the spider thing, which I'm pretty sure shows up on the very end of the chapter five alkene. Um, yes, because the bromine. So when we take a look at this structure, it's not going to matter. We're going to end up with one product. Uh, pretty sure we end up with one product. Um, because our starting material doesn't have a difference between the top lobe of the p orbital versus the bottom lobe of our p orbital. As soon as we add a methyl group in there, we can now generate new stereocenters and everything kind of changes. This one actually gives two products too. And it's that up down. It's the bromine coming in from the top or coming in from the bottom. So then your other product would just be switched. Yes. The wedge Yep. What would the relationship be between those products? In this case, they aren't diastereomers, they would be enantiomers. Okay. I think once you, even with the methyl, they'll end up being enantiomers. It's only when you add something that didn't react that you'd get diastereomers. Okay. More questions about that one? Okay. Worst case, you see bromine in an alkene, what should you draw? You're showing me that bromine does add to the double bond. You just don't know the stereochemistry. That's fine. Stereochemistry is the hardest level of it. Go through the basics first, level it up, and make it more difficult if you can. If you can't remember it, then don't worry about it. Okay? Make sense? Um, one of the other addition reactions we could run is reacting with hydrogen. Um, probably didn't need to show this whole big slide, but this was ultimately showing us that the hydrogen adds syn. Okay, so we get a syn addition of hydrogen across the double bond, meaning our hydrogens add to the same side of the double bond. Whereas when we did bromine, we ended up with the anti-product, okay, or our trans product. Here we get cis products, okay, when we do our hydrogen additions. Um, when you add hydrogen, you must, must, must specify one of those metal catalysts as well, okay? If you just tell me H2, H2 and the alkene are not going to react, okay? It needs the metal catalyst to force the reaction to occur, okay? Um, we also did an oxidation reaction. I think this is the last, almost the last one on this. Um, so we can use the OSO4. Technically, this is two steps. So if you look at the spider diagrams that I've given you, it's shown as step one and step two. Okay. Um, the textbook has not been consistent at all with what step two should be. 
Okay? They've gone from it being the sodium bisulfite to a peroxide to something else, I think. I don't even remember what the something else was. Okay? Because the textbook's not consistent with what that second step is, I'm not going to stress about that. Okay? So what you should be able to tell me is to get the diol product, you need to add OSO4. Okay? And that's what I'll key in on and find. If you specify the extra information, sure, why not? I'll give you extra credit. Okay? As long as that extra information is right. Tell me the wrong stuff, I won't give you points for that. Okay? There's another reagent that does this same step. What chemical was that? Sorry, what was that? Permanganate, yeah. We can do it also with KMNO4. You should also specify that's cold and dilute. Okay? And that's because hot and concentrated gives you a different product. Okay? Questions about these two reactions? Okay. Um, I did edit this slide, for those of you that may or may not remember when we first talked about the epoxides, I did all sorts of messed up drawings and crossing things out in this lower right hand corner. I went through and fixed that. Okay? Uh, as far as what you would expect to see as far as reagent usage, MCPBA is the chemical name that you would need to remember, or the chemical reagent. MCPBA will react with alkenes to generate the epoxide. Okay, the epoxide is officially just that three-membered ring. Okay, the rest of that's there just because it looks pretty. Okay, um, the epoxide is a very highly strained ring, so it's very reactive with nucleophiles, and we can react those under two different conditions: either acidic conditions, so we add H plus into our reaction or we do it under basic conditions, or ultimately neutral conditions. And in those cases, really what we're looking at is a negative nucleophile as opposed to a neutral nucleophile in the case of our acidic conditions. Okay. When we look at the acidic conditions, H plus will react with the oxygen first. We now have an incredibly good leaving group and a stable carbocation potentially forming. The bond breaks, and our nucleophile can now come in and react with a carbocation. The carbocation has two sides, an up and a down, which means we get two products, our nucleophile either being coming in from the back side or from the top, from the bottom or from the top, and that gives us two products. Okay. If we look under basic conditions, no carbocation means there's only one way for the nucleophile to attack. Okay. So it's going to have to come in, and since I don't have that OH, that good leaving group, anymore for the basic conditions, I have to force the oxygen to break. That's what the nucleophile is for, and it's going to have to come in from the backside. As soon as you hear backside, you should immediately be thinking SN2 type reactions, which means our nucleophile is going to attack at the least sterically hindered site. And that's where we get our product, or where, why our nucleophile shows up on a different position than if we did the acidic catalyst. Okay? <coughs> the epoxides are a difficult concept. Um, almost everybody forgets about them, even more advanced students too. Okay? Even I forget about them. So you can probably expect to not see a lot of them as well. Questions about the epoxides? You guys actually still drawing something there? No? Okay. Um, alkynes, kind of floating around in a weird gray area because we don't have uh, a chapter specifically on them. Um, so we kind of just tacked them in at the end of chapter five as far as our alkene chemistry goes. Alkynes are extra special um, because they get the same functionality that alkenes do with the pi bonds, okay, which we'll look at in the next slide. But they get this one extra boost. That extra boost is that the carbon in the alkyne is a little bit different than in an alkene or an alkane. What's the difference? This is SP hybridized. 
That means it's more S character than P character. What's the difference between an S and a P orbital? Lower energy is true. The S orbital is held tighter to the nucleus or closer to the nucleus. So the less hybridization, so the more S character, the higher the electronegativity goes. The more electronegative, the more acidic that carbon-hydrogen bond becomes. Okay? So the alkyne functional group, when it's at the end of a, a carbon chain, can act as an acid and be deprotonated by a strong base. Okay? That gives us a negatively charged carbon, also known as the acetylide ion. That's really cool because it's a base, and more importantly, it's a nucleophile. Okay? So the alkyne chemistry, as little as we may have had to work with it, is huge as far as chemistry goes. Okay? So you can fully expect to see some alkyne questions on there. Okay? The next big part of our alkynes that I want to address here is that we have to use a very particular strong base. In this case, we are going to use sodium amide. Okay? We can't get away with sodium hydroxide because it's not strong enough to deprotonate. Okay? So as strong a base as uh, sodium hydroxide is, it's not good enough. Okay? So you either have to use sodium amide or you can specify it shorthanded as the NH2 minus. Why NH2 minus as opposed to NaNH2? What bond is there between sodium and nitrogen? It's an ionic bond. So we get sodium ion and amide ion. What does sodium ion do in most reactions, or all reactions? Fat load to nothing. Okay, so we can ignore the sodium if you so choose. Okay. Questions about our alkynes as far as them acting as acids. Okay. The next thing that we could do, and I talked even less about this, um, we can have alkynes react with hydrogen uh, in a reduction, just like we do with our alkenes. We can also react them with bromine, or for that matter, chlorine. Okay. Um, because there's two pi bonds, both pi bonds will react. So we react once to form an alkene. If we're going to react with hydrogen, we'd form once to react it form an alkene. As long as we still got hydrogen and catalyst there, we're going to react again to form our alkane. Okay? Um, we can do the same kind of thing with bromine, probably a little bit less frequently. Um, that whole hydrogen reduction catalyst is probably something you're going to see at least once on the exam. Bromine with the alkyne, a little bit less likely. Okay? See a puzzled look there? Do we have any questions? No? Okay. Um, we did do an example of a reaction with the alkynes uh, at the end of Chapter 5 uh, lectures. Um, I didn't include it in these slides, so you can go back and look at the video uh, to see what's happening with that. It was one of those multi-step reactions. Okay. As far as the alkene summary goes, um, what's up here is, I believe, eight reactions. You're responsible for what? Starting materials, uh, products, stereochemistry. Here's the word regiochemistry again. So ultimately, just where do the atoms go? So if you know what your products are, you're fine as far as regiochemistry goes. Okay? Um, so that's roughly eight reactions on this chart, okay? which summarizes, I think, all of the alkene materials. Okay, so it's now all up on one slide. Um, I would highly recommend that you convert this in some form or another to your cheat sheet. It must be handwritten. Okay? If it is just copied and pasted from the slides, I will take off points. Okay? Um, I would also say that the spider diagram is probably not the most efficient use of space when using your, uh, building your cheat sheet. Um, so what I would probably do is classify it as alkene reactions and then list them underneath it and just lines, okay, as opposed to spidering outwards. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, questions about our alkenes? Okay. Um, 
I did add a little bit extra here because we talked about acids. I just forgot to keep sliding the homework in, make sure it was accented. Um, so I'll, I did a little bit of glancing over to make sure that you guys are aware of all of the alcohol, amine, and acid homework. Um, we're for sure, if you're looking at the textbook, is anybody using the textbook at all? Okay, two or three people, good. We're going to permanently skip, in case you couldn't tell already, sections 8.6 and 8.7. Um, they're just not worth talking about. And then with the amines, 10.7 to the end of the chapter. We're also skipping those too. Okay. Um, so with the amines and with the acids, pretty much the only things that you're getting tested on there are fairly simple things. Amines react as what? You should have it memorized. Bases. Carboxylic acids act as a bit redundant, but why not? Act as acids. Okay? So that's what those reactions are looking at. So when it looks like when it says reactions for uh, chapter 14, it's just having a carboxylic acid functional group act as an acid. Okay? When we look at basicity in the amines from chapter 10, it's just reactions where they're acting as a base. Okay? Um, physical properties should be fairly short as far as questions go there. You're looking at intermolecular forces and just kind of ranking the forces. And then nomenclature. Okay, so we've got a decent amount of functional groups now to make nomenclature a bit of a beast as far as this exam goes. Okay, um, as far as nomenclature problems, I will not put more than three functional groups within an individual compound not including alkanes, okay? And I probably wouldn't do as many as three. Probably, probably be in that two range for the high end, okay? So if you take a look at the quiz where you had to do nomenclature, there was that really big one that had six different things in it. You won't see that, okay? Um, I think that's it as far as homework questions. The next, what? the next sequence of slides are all the nomenclature rules. So we've got our alcohols, our acids, the amines, and then the simple primary amines, okay? Um, our simple primary, secondary, and tertiary amines, so giving them slightly different names. Uh, did anybody have any particular questions about nomenclature that you wanted me to work through? Otherwise, we're just going to say that we've talked about that. Yes? Uh, so should that be folic acid or just butic acid? Oh, yeah. I should have fixed that. It is oic acid. What? Yeah, that should be oic acid. Um, I'm sure if we look hard enough, we'll find an exception, and I'm wrong. But oic acid at least covers most of them. Okay. Other questions with the uh, nomenclatures? Okay. Um, about physical properties, we're going back to that chart. You should be familiar with that. Remember, that gives you lots of information solubilities, reactivities, all of that fun stuff, okay? So if you can classify individual bonds, you can then classify their uh, intermolecular forces. The stronger the force, um, potentially the more reactive that force is going to become, and uh, higher melting points or boiling points. It's going to require more energy to break that force to get those molecules away from each other, okay? Um, go ahead and just leave that. Come on. A nice summary, or at least what I think is a nice summary of all of the functional groups that we've looked at, except for the carboxylic acids, just because they didn't quite fit on here. Um, it was an attempt to just summarize all the possible sites of reactivity within each of these functional groups. Okay? I promise you, by the end of this semester, and I mean by end, I mean on the final, you can expect to see a question along these lines. Here's six different functional groups. 
tell me everything about their reactivity. So if you see an alcohol, you should immediately be able to tell me that it's got an electrophilic carbon, a nucleophilic oxygen, a Bronsted-Lowry basic oxygen, and an acidic hydrogen. Okay? That should be second nature. Okay? If it's not second nature, you're going to have a lot of problems with all the other reactions. Okay? Then you're just guessing at reactions and hoping that you had everything memorized. The hope is that you see this, these sites of reactivity and can start to classify the individual reactions. So I've been grouping them according to these reactions, or these reactivities. Okay? Um, as an example kind of question on what you can expect, like I said, final. Um, exam three, which I guess is a good point. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Remind me at the end of this lecture, so I say it again. Exam three is reasonable as far as what you can expect for this exam, except anything that says chapter nine. Okay? Everything else is fair game. Okay, so there's two or three pages, I think, uh, in the old exam three uh, that are all chapter nine questions. Okay? And then the very last reaction, um, predict the reaction or reagent, something like that question, um, the very last one of those is also from chapter nine. Okay? Everything else on that exam is fair game. Okay? as well as more in-depth stuff, too, I'm sure. Um, probably should have moved this slide a little bit further up, but this summarizes all of the reactions that we've seen and had to deal with. So we've got our acid-base chemistry. Okay, so we're looking at hydrogen transfers. And ultimately, when we say acid-base, we're referring to which type of acid-base? Our Bronsted-Lowry definitions, not our Lewis definitions. Okay. In the next reaction, we've got what type of reaction? Substitution. The next one is elimination. And the last one, addition. Okay. Just like that previous slide, I was saying it should be second nature to you as far as identifying the different reactivities of individual functional groups. This should be second nature to you. If I show you something where it's completely impossible to determine what atoms they are, but I set up these particular patterns of reactions, you should be able to tell me what occurred. Okay? So if we start with two things and end with two things, what reaction is that? That's a bit trickier. Probably substitution or we could see acid base. Okay, how would we distinguish between those two? You look for the hydrogen. So if a hydrogen was exchanged, if that was what was substituted, it's an acid-base reaction, not officially a substitution. If you start with one thing and end with multiple, what type of reaction? Start with one thing and end with multiple? That's an elimination. We took pieces out. We decomposed it. We eliminated things from our overall structure. If we start with two things and we end with one, now we've got the addition. Okay? And that works as a general format as far as identifying these reactions. Okay? It doesn't work all the time because sometimes we need to add catalysts and other things like that that can make it a little bit more difficult to sort it out. Okay? Depends on the question. If I ask you what mechanism did this go by, if you just tell me substitution, you told me the type of reaction, but you didn't tell me the mechanism. Okay. If I ask just for you to tell me what reaction occurred, substitution is fine. If I ask for the mechanism, you need to be telling me what it specifically is, SN1 or SN2. Yes? And then in the elimination, you'll always see what was eliminated, right? Or is it ever just like... In a balanced equation, in a balanced equation, it will be, it will show up. If it's not balanced, yeah. yeah. So what else could you look for then, trying to determine an elimination? If it's not balanced, we can't say we start with one and end with multiple. But it's not balanced. What's that? I think somebody said it. Look for the double bond. If the double bond shows up. 
Only one of those reactions produces a double bond. That's the elimination. Okay? If the double bond disappears, what reaction do we do? Addition. So it's looking for those patterns and identifying which ones match as best as possible. That can help you classify what type of reaction, which can potentially also help you classify what reagents you can use, okay? depending on how well organized your cheat sheet is. Okay. Questions on that? Um, acid base strengths. Okay, so I just kind of summarized those all over again. Um, I would recommend that you go back to the lecture slides and push through the examples um, in those lectures, trying to make sure you understand why one is more acidic or basic than another. But it's ultimately coming back to these same types of rules. Okay. As a general summary, uh, your acids or your halogens will only act as acids when with hydrogen uh, or leaving groups. Your oxygens can act as acids or bases. Uh, your nitrogens will really only be basic. We won't see them act as acids. And then your carbons are ultimately neutral. To get them to act as an acid or a base requires a little bit of effort. Okay? There has to be something to force them to act as an acid or a base. Okay? You want an example on that one? For instance, Whoop, I don't want that. Would I expect any of those hydrogens to be acidic? No. We're looking at just carbons to hydrogens. We wouldn't expect any of those to be particularly acidic. But what happens now? Would I expect any of those hydrogens to now be acidic? a big hint. This hydrogen is pretty acidic. Why would that hydrogen be acidic? What's the result? I moved from a position where I had a positive charge on a carbon to a positive charge on a hydrogen. Which atom would rather be positively charged? Hydrogen, okay? So we can force carbon to act as, in this case, an acid, okay? But we have to have something around it to force it to act as an acid or as a base, okay? It's not just going to do it on its own. Kind of make sense? Come on. Oh, I'm doing the wrong button. Substitution review, okay, you guys have seen this slide a whole bunch of times. I would really, 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 really hope this is all memorized. Yeah, kind of, sort of, at least half of it, okay. Um, when it comes to alcohol reactions with substitution, um, in all cases, we have to activate that alcohol for a substitution reaction. What we're looking at doing is having our electrophilic carbon react. So it's that electrophilic carbon. Okay? So to get that to react, I have to make that alcohol or that oxygen willing to leave. Okay? So the oxygen must be pre-activated to allow it to, to leave. In the first case, we just add a strong acid. That strong acid supplies hydrogens. Our alcohol acts as a source of electrons, also known as a base, donates the electrons to hydrogen. We end up with that oxonium, or oxygen positive charge, um, not stable, and it can fall apart and react in our substitution reaction. If we don't add a strong acid, we can add another reagent. In this case, the only case that we're really evaluating is adding thionyl chloride. The oxygen reacts with our sulfur, which is partially positive much the same way that our hydrogen was partially positive. Okay, so we can activate our alcohol with multiple different sources. Both of them will allow this to then react and do our substitution. Okay. The last big substitution reaction 
is a little bit counterintuitive. Instead of sourcing our reactivity at our carbon, we source the reactivity at our oxygen, and we look at our oxygen acting as a nucleophile. For it to act as a nucleophile, what do we need to do? We need to make it negative, so I have to make the alcohol act as what kind of a species? To make the alcohol negative, what do I need to, has to act as? An acid, it needs to react with a, with a base. I mislabeled them all over the place. Okay, so I don't blame you for getting that mixed up. Okay. Um, to get it negative, we have to be able to pull that hydrogen off using a strong base. This is, again, just like the alkyne. With the alkyne, we said you had to know sodium amide for it to react. With the alcohols, you have to know sodium hydride. Okay. You have to use that as your strong base. Once we've done that, we've got the negative oxygen. That negative oxygen can react with an electrophilic carbon, which is in that second step, and we can get our substitution reaction. Okay. Questions about those overall reactions? Okay. We then have our elimination reactions, or our elimination summaries, deciding which mechanism, either E1 or E2. Um, when it comes to alcohols, to get them to react in an elimination, okay, or let's take that a step back. When we look at our eliminations, we usually add, let's see, is it up here? Oh, it's not up here. What's one of the common things or red flags for an elimination mechanism that you would look for? I've talked to a few people about it. Heat. Because what we need to do is have that carbon-hydrogen bond break. We have to have an acidic carbon to allow for an elimination reaction. One of the ways we can make that bond easier to break or more acidic is to add heat to cause the bond to break. The other way we can do it is add a base to break that carbon-hydrogen bond. Okay, so that's in our standard elimination reactions. When we move to being an alcohol, we can't add a base to break our carbon-hydrogen. Because if we add a base, we're going to deprotonate the strongest acid in there. Where's the most acidic hydrogen in an alcohol? the one on the oxygen. So if we add a strong base, the result is we get a negatively charged oxygen. If I said now I want to try and do my elimination, I would have to kick out that oxygen as what for a leaving group? We don't like negatively charged leaving groups. How about a negatively two charged leaving group? Okay. Really, 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 really bad idea. Okay. So when it comes to elimination reactions with alcohols, we cannot add a base. Bases will not cause those to work. What we have to add instead is an acid. The acid will activate our alcohol. And at that point, we now have the possibility for an elimination reaction to kick off because our oxygen does not want to be positively charged. There's our oxonium. It can start to take electrons from the carbon. If we add enough heat to this reaction, we can cause that other bond to break to get our elimination. Okay. So what type of mechanism do you set? What type of elimination would you expect for most alcohols? E1 or E2? E2 requires what? A strong base. Okay. What did we say? We had to react to get our alcohol to go? An acid. So what does that mean? We'll likely see E1 mechanisms when we look at alcohol eliminations. There are exceptions. So if we end up shifting into positions where we cannot physically possibly do uh, uh, an E1, then we can sometimes force it to do the E2 elimination by adding just a lot of heat. 
Okay. Other questions on the eliminations? Okay. I know we're kind of picking up pace. I want to make sure we get through all of these. Our reduction in oxidations. Uh, I removed the slide that summarized or gave some examples of trying to decide what happened in each case in favor of looking at our definitions. Our oxidation reactions are decreasing the number of hydrogen bonds uh, and increasing the number of electronegative bonds. Typically, our electronegative bond increase is to what atom? Oxygen. That's why we're looking at oxidations. When we move to reduction, we're now increasing the number of hydrogen bonds at a loss of our electronegative bonds or the loss of our oxygens. Okay? So you have to compare across a reaction and decide what things changed. Okay? The same thing that I've been trying to get you guys to do for the whole semester, except now you don't have to predict anything. You just have to say what changed. If you increased or decreased these ox or hydrogen or electronegative bonds. Okay? So it's kind of an easier case, if you will. I mean, it's not much easier. Okay, but it should help uh, as far as Id identifying those reactions. I don't like oil rig, but that's because I was born in August. Anybody? What's August birthstone or sign? Is Virgo? Oh, move earlier in the month. Leo. What's the one that I like? Leo says Gur. That's why it started. But that's looking at the electron count. You would have to look at the oxidation state of each of the carbons, okay? which works. You can do that. I just don't do it well. I do this a lot better. So I'll teach you this. That was a nice distraction. So reduction and oxidation reactions. Uh, since we're concerned primarily about our alcohols, I went through and figured we'd keep this slide even though it doesn't show the reagents. Our primary alcohols have two possible oxidation steps. We can take them to an aldehyde or all the way to the carboxylic acid. If we start with a secondary alcohol, we'll stop at our <coughs> ketone. We can't oxidize any further than that because there's no hydrogens on that carbon, okay, on our reactive carbon. Um, to allow for the oxidation. Okay, we've only got one hydrogen there, so one oxidation step. In our primary, we've got two hydrogens, so two oxidation steps. In our tertiary, we have zero hydrogens, so no oxidation steps. Okay. The two reagents that you're responsible for as far as your oxidation reactions go, um, oh, sorry. See if it does it now. Uh, would be chromic acid and PCC. Uh, when you think chromic acid, you should be thinking carboxylic acids. Okay? So if you need to make a carboxylic acid functional group, chromic acid is the way to go. Okay? What's that? Um What would I accept? Um, four, right? And it's four. four, yeah. So I fix some typos, but not all of them. So I guess I can delay while I write four. Um, I will accept any one of those three options. So you can write out chromic acid. You can write out H2CrO4, or you can write out what's technically uh, dichromate sulfuric acid in heat. Okay. Whichever one you've got written in your notes or happen to memorize will be fine. Okay. So chromic acid, for me personally, I would only think to use chromic acid when I wanted a carboxylic acid. Okay. And that's going to be starting with a primary alcohol. So that's the only reaction I would zero in on for chromic acid. Why? Because PCC does more interesting things or does the same thing as chromic acid except I can also get an aldehyde, or I can get an aldehyde instead of a carboxylic acid. Okay. So I would use chromic acid if I want to get a function or a carboxylic acid. If I want anything else, aldehyde or ketone, I'd use PCC. Okay. 
PCC was just politically correct chromic acid, so it's just a little bit milder, right? Questions about that? Button. Okay. Hallelujah. There we go. So, if you guys remember, I said eight reactions from the alkenes, alcohols, we got 13. So, on this test, not counting any of the alkyl halide reactivity, um, largely because it's hard to count reactions with those, um, you've got 21 reactions that you're responsible for knowing. Yes. Front and back. Yeah. So your cheat sheet, you can use both the front and back, but not two pages. Just one sheet of paper, front and back. Okay. Um, anything I wanted to add on this? I did not show, I don't know why I didn't get it in there. Um, so really we got 14 reactions. Sorry, I didn't summarize it very well. We can get the alcohol from the ketone by doing what? What type of reaction would that be? We're going from a double bond oxygen to a single bond oxygen. It's a reduction reaction. We are adding hydrogen to the structure. What reagent allows us to add hydrogen to a structure? How about hydrogen? Hydrogen gas over one of those metal catalysts, palladium, platinum, nickel, one of those. Okay. And now you got 22 reactions. It was still there. You were still wrong, responsible for it. I didn't just add it. Just making sure. Don't get mad at me. Or more mad at me. Okay. So you've got a lot of reactions as far as organization for a cheat sheet. Um, what am I trying to do? For me personally, what I would do with a cheat sheet is try and organize um, kind of bulk general material. So I would try and organize it and say, okay, what do I have in chapter four? Okay. Main reason why I would organize this is that you would hope, so I'll switch into your shoes, you would hope that I as the instructor would maintain the same format that I've been doing with all the other exams and labeling the questions, chapter four, chapter five, et cetera, okay? So you can organize your cheat sheet along those same lines. Chapter four, what things are important in chapter four? See how much you paid attention from earlier. That good, huh? Okay, we're looking at alkenes. We've got nomenclature. We had the EZ. We add our isoprenes, and I almost forgot it again, our saturations. Okay? Of those, putting on a cheat sheet, isoprene is probably not going to help. Okay? Um, so I wouldn't spend any space on that. If I had the space, I might draw an isoprene just for the heck of it, and maybe an example one so I knew what was going on with it, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time with that. Saturation, I'd include the formulas, work a few problems, and hope seeing the formulas would be enough. Um, I wouldn't try and do anything beyond that on the cheat sheet. E and Z, I would include the notes, because I personally, or the steps, because I personally like the steps that I, did, that I told you guys, so I would include those steps, because I think they're helpful. Nomenclature, you already know my opinion on nomenclature. I wouldn't waste any space on it on a cheat sheet. Um, but that's just me. Okay. We then have chapter 5. Okay. And this is where I think it would get a little bit more difficult. Because for me, what I would do is set up just kind of bulk facts about each of the chapters on one part of my cheat sheet. And on the other part, I would do my reactions. Okay, reactions of 
for half of it, and synthesis. Ooh, that's a Y. Synthesis. Is that spelled right? Mm -hmm. Synthesis of. Okay. And then I would divide those into the individual things. Reactions of alkenes. And then just list them all off. Reactions of alcohols. And list them all off. Synthesis of alkenes and our alcohols, which reminds me, I have a text file, like a document that has a lot of these summarized. Um, unfortunately, it has a bunch of extra reactions and some other superfluous information which might confuse you. I will post that to Canvas. If you want to use it, go ahead and use that to help kind of organize your cheat sheet as far as your thoughts. Um, but be careful, there's a lot of extra stuff in it that you don't need, okay? Back to chapter five. Um, what do we do in chapter five? That was pretty much just a lot of reactions. I don't think we really had any just straight memorization material, right? Um, I might add some information there about maybe some of the acid reactions. So maybe add some information about stereochemistry. I'm going to use the word again, our regiochemistry. Okay, so where do individual groups go? Um, those kind of pieces of information I would try and squeeze into my reactions portion, but I may just not have enough space. It may just get too cluttered. Okay. Oops. Um, yeah, really, we're just reactions of chapter five. Huh? Then we've got chapter eight, and since the way we talked about eight was grouping it with nine and ten, uh, or sorry, ten and ultimately fourteen, I would probably group them all together in one section because that's how we talked about it in class. So more than likely, if I'm trying to predict what the instructor is going to do seems a bit odd, but um, I would probably group them all together. Because more than likely, they aren't going to spend the time to separate it away when they didn't spend the time to separate it away to begin with. Okay. What information do we have with 8, 10, and 14? We've got nomenclature. In this case, I personally would probably add a little bit of information on the alcohols amines and acids just because I personally am not as comfortable with those as I am with the alkene nomenclature. Okay. Um, again, I wouldn't spend much, but I'd put a little bit of information there to help me out with it. Okay. I would also try and include something about their bulk reactivity, which we should have done with the alkenes. So I would note alkenes equal Lewis bases, Bronsted bases. Okay, so I've got an idea for their reactivity. When it comes to the alcohols, we've got that massive list, so I would pretty much copy that slide. We got What do we say? Oxygen was a nucleophile. Oxygen was a base. Hydrogen was an acid, Bronsted acid. And the carbon was an electrophile. Okay, kind of makes sense? Do the same kind of thing with the amines. Except, what did we say was the amines? Bases. Okay, if they're a base, they can still act as nucleophiles. I would kind of run under the assumption we didn't talk about that a whole lot. I might note it just in case, but probably not going to be as important. We then have the acids. I wouldn't write acids equal acids. I would hope that I would remember that on the test. Um, one notational thing that I would note that you guys probably wouldn't have to is that COOH equals the carboxylic acid. Why would you not have to note that? Because you all know me so well that I hate this notation, and I would never do that to you on a test. Okay. After that, 
I would then move over to my reactions of alcohols, and I would group those. Okay, with the alkenes, it was kind of difficult to categorize those, but with the alcohols, we can. We've got alcohols acting as acids. What kind of chemistry can they do when they act as acids? We've got alcohols acting as bases. What chemistry is available to them then? What happens if it's the carbon acting for substitution? Okay. What if it's the carbon acting for elimination? That could run out of space. Oxygen for oxidation. Oxygen for reduction. So trying to classify those groups of reactions into a nice organized fashion. So that if I'm trying to pull up questions, I can look at them really, really, really fast. I know I just filled up this sheet pretty... Actually, it didn't look too bad. Um, I would also add information about the substitution, addition, elimination, acid bases. Okay, Get those general reactions down so that if for some reason I just can't figure anything out and I'm looking at an equation and can't figure out what's going on, I'll try and play a matching game with something that I do know. Okay, if you've provided yourself an example substitution reaction, you can now compare. Does that make sense? Um, last thing that I would mention would be characteristic acids, characteristic bases. Okay? So if you need a strong base, write somewhere strong base equals. You now have a reagent. Okay? Um, summary in chapter 8 might be those acid base rules as well. Okay, sneaking those into it. Okay, kind of makes sense. So what do you think? More confident, less confident after that? The same? Okay. Um, as soon as I get the exam written, I will try and post some more information about it. We still have a little bit of time. I know not much. Um, but if you've got questions, uh, you can go ahead and ask.